Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's science and conservation event brought to you by ZSL, the Zoological Society of London. My name is Guy Cowlishaw and I'm going to be chairing tonight's event which asks the question, can understanding animal personalities help us to improve conservation? I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute of Zoology, which is the research arm of ZSL. And I specialize personally in animal behavior, ecology, and conservation. Some of my research has included work on primate personalities in this area. So I'm really delighted to be hosting the event tonight. We've got four amazing speakers lined up for you, all of whom study animal behavior and personality. Their studies span a range of species, including primates, birds, and fish, among others. In addition, their research is conducted across a variety of settings, from the wild to captivity, to threatened species that are making a transition between the two, from captive breeding into the wild in, reintrodu in reintroduction programs. Tonight, we'll hear from these experts about animal personality and how we might be able to make it an invaluable part of the conservation toolkit. But before we get going, I'd like to remind you how you can take part in tonight's event, because we'd love to hear from you and we welcome your questions for our speakers. Okay, so there are two ways that you can participate. Uh, first of all, you can go to the Pigeonhole webpage at www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931 and post your questions there. That's www dot pigeonhole dot at forward slash 1931 or you can scan the QR code that you can see on the screen. Once at pigeonhole you can simply type in your questions for the speakers. If your question is for a particular speaker please remember to state their name in that question. On the web page you'll also see that you can upvote other people's questions so if there's one that you'd particularly like to see answered please do vote for it and we'll do our best to ask, the, ask our speakers uh, those particular questions. If for any reason you can't access that web page, then you can also email us uh, with your questions to scientific.events at zsl.org. So that's scientific.events at zsl.org, and we'll add them to Pigeonhole for you. I'll be reminding you of these details later on, and they're also in the YouTube description below. Also, at the end of the event, I'll be sharing a survey monkey link with you because it's really helpful for us to hear what you think of the event. I'm going to get us back to tonight's event now, and I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Alicia Carter. Alicia is a lecturer in evolutionary anthropology in the Department of Anthropology at University College London. Her research focuses on the behavior and cognition of wild animals, most frequently using baboons to answer her research questions. Her research in her PhD addressed how and why animals' behavior varies from others, but is consistent through time. Alicia now investigates how primates respond to the deaths of others and what this can tell us about the evolution of cognition and emotion, and how animal social networks and individual characteristics determine how they access information to make decisions. Alicia will be starting us off tonight with a presentation that also helps us to set the scene for the rest of the evening, entitled A Very Brief Introduction to Animal Personality Research. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Guy, for that um, lovely introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and start. Great. So I'm, I'm so excited to give you a very brief introduction to animal personality research. And um, I'm going to start my very brief introduction with a very brief outline of what this talk is going to look like tonight. So I'm going to start by talking about what we know about human personality before I move on to understanding animal personality. And at the very end, I'll ask some exciting questions about um, whether in animal personalities impact animals' lives. So um, on to the first question, uh, what is human personality? So when we think about personality, we probably think of the personality descriptors that we use to describe people. So we can use things like warm, impulsive, enthusiastic, but there are two main characteristics about these personality descriptors that we implicitly understand by them. The first is that um, 
these descriptors are describe consistencies within individuals through time. So if we describe somebody as warm, then they will be warm um, at multiple points in their uh, life. And the second implicit um, understanding is that these uh, behaviors or these descriptors differ among, uh, among individuals. So we know that if um, somebody is described as warm, then there are other people that we could describe as cold or not warm. So this is a good place to start when understanding a, a human personality, but one of the problems that we run into is that there are, in at least the English language, over four and a half thousand personality descriptors. So one of the first problems that early personality researchers in humans had to deal with was how to take four and a half thousand descriptors and then turn them into something um, useful. And what they did was um, a statistical analysis called factor analysis, and they came up with what is currently known as the Big Five. And the Big Five can be summarized with this um, handy acronym. And these are the Big Five factors that describe human personality. They are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Now, there are four things to understand about these big five um, factors. And the first one to know is that these factors are continua. So openness can vary from um, closed at one end to open-minded at the other. And individuals can sit on this, um, can anywhere on this continuum. It happens to be that um, openness is normally distributed. So most people are um, not very closed and not very open, um, but there are individuals that fall at those ends. Um, the second thing to, to know is that multiple descriptors can fall onto one of these, um, one of these personality continuum. So, for example, um, people who are uh, creative, um, intellectual, artistic, philosophical, they all fall onto this um, openness um, continuum. The same goes for the other uh, four continuum. The third thing that you need to know is that the placement that somebody has on one of these continua, continuum continua does not predict where somebody will sit on the other continuum. So for example, uh, somebody could look something like this. Um, the important thing is that if somebody is mid um, open, then they're not mid conscientious, extroverted, etc. Okay, the fourth thing you need to know about um, human personality is that they are predictive of um, life outcomes. So for example, um, educational achievement, uh, mental and physical health outcomes, and whether an individual ends up in a leadership position, not whether they're good at it, but whether they end up in a leadership position, um, can be determined by their personality. Okay, so that was a very brief introduction to um, personality in humans, and I'm going to um, now move on to the second part of the talk, which is um, what is animal personality. So for anybody who owns a pet, this question is probably um, not one worth asking, but humans, uh, well, but scientists have um, have tried to avoid anthropomorphizing, that is putting, um, uh, taking a subjective understanding of what we as humans understand and putting that on animals um, by referring to or thinking about animals as automata. That view is um, definitely changed now, um, but when um, researchers started researching animal personality, it wasn't uh, understood that animals could vary in their behavior in the way that humans do. But in fact, it, it is the case, as any pet owner will know, that um, animals are also consistent within themselves in their behavior through time, and that they differ among individuals in their behavior through time. So this has been done in a, a wide variety of species. Um, these ones that you can see here is just a tiny selection of the, um, of the species that have been, um, in which personality has been described. Um, but then the question is, how do we measure animal personality? So we are probably all familiar with how we measure human personality. We give you a personality questionnaire that you can fill out, but you can't give an animal a personality questionnaire. So I'm going to describe two ways that scientists have tackled this question. Um, and the first way was, um, is common to one particular field, differential psychology. And they take a very holistic approach um, with this, uh, with addressing animal personality in the same way that early psychologists dealt with human personality. So instead of asking animals 
how they would fill in a questionnaire, they ask observers who are very familiar with those animals to fill in a personality questionnaire. Now, at the beginning, they most, uh, most of these researchers studied um, primate personality, and it's a little bit easier to grasp because um, we tend to use similar uh, words to describe primates um, as what we use for humans. And this, this approach has been quite successful. So, for example, in chimpanzees, some researchers have described um, using the same kind of factor analysis that has been used for humans, um, a, a five factor model um, with the same kinds of factors that humans have, plus an extra sixth factor describing dominance, because dominance is such an important and um, overtly obvious trait in chimpanzees. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to the second way that we can. Um, assess animal personality, and that has been a much more recent approach in, um, in behavioral ecology. So from the early 2000s or the 2010s, uh, behavioral ecology researchers have tried to broaden out the number of species or the types of species that are being studied, but have um, targeted particular traits. So instead of having this holistic approach where we try to get multiple um, multiple factors, we tend to do um, targeted uh, experiments to identify animals' responses to one um, particular situation in order to describe one trait. So for example, here is a picture of a baboon who I've given a novel food to in an effort to measure that baboon's boldness. Now, some of my colleagues have provided some, um, some videos. So my co colleague uh, Vedrana Spiloga has, um, Slipoga, sorry, has used um, novel objects in the field to measure um, boldness. So here you can see an individual who is approaching this novel object and investigating it. And this is just done in the wild in Brazil. So that's one other way of measuring boldness. Um, my colleague, uh, Niels Dinkemanza from um, LMU and Munchen has tried to quantify aggression in great tits by providing, by placing this model in the field. Um, this model of a great tit in front of the nest box of another great tit. And you can see the individual, hopefully it's streaming nicely for you, but in any case, you can see this individual trying to attack this model um, in the field. Now, the important thing with these tests is that if you do them multiple times, you can estimate how repeatable, how consistent those individuals are in their behavior. Um, and we can show that they differ between individuals. So this is uh, one other way of measuring personality in the wild. So I'm going to move on to the third part of this talk. So do animals uh, personalities impact um, their lives in the same kind of way that humans do? Um, I'm showing you data here from uh, from humans, actually. So this is uh, what we what we know of as subjective well-being. I think um, the, in the current COVID times, we're uh, far more familiar with this idea of well-being than um, than previously. But um, this graph shows that uh, well-being on average changes with age. So although people are consistent in uh, whether they rate themselves as having high or low well-being across their lives, it will change in this predictable U-shaped way. And this is colloquially known as, um, as the midlife crisis. So this is what's happening with humans. If we take this, a similar holistic psychology approach um, in primates and ask observers how uh, how much they would like to be the individual that they're rating, we get a similar response in great apes. So you can see here four different graphs, um, two samples of chimpanzees, one sample of orangutans, and then um, one graph with all of those individuals together. And you can see that they also have this U-shaped um, U-shaped response in their well-being. So the authors argue that actually uh, the, the um, midlife crisis that we see in humans has some phylogenetic inertia. Um, and then it might not just be a social construct at all. So to take, uh, to give you an example from behavioral ecology, I'm going with these targeted traits. I'm going to um, use an example from the field site that um, I'm a co-director of. So together with Guy Kellershaw, who's who you've met earlier tonight, and Elise Ouchard from the University of Montpellier in the CNRS in France, we co-direct the Talbos Baboon Project, which is a long-term project um, that studies two uh, groups of fully habituated baboons in Namibia. Um, and the research that I've been particularly interested in for the last, um, I guess, half a decade has been on how individuals get information to make decisions. 
So one way that individuals can learn about their environment is by paying attention to what others are doing. So in this photograph here, you can see an individual who is smelling the mouth of another individual of the group in order to learn about what she's just eaten and what is an edible food at this field site. So the question that I had was, where, was does personality impact this kind of social learning? So are some individuals more likely to learn socially than others? And this is important because um, social information is a way for information to quickly spread through groups. But if some individuals aren't social learning or aren't learning as much as um, or aren't relying on social information as much as others, it can either um, slow down or completely impede information transmission through that group. So I wanted to know whether boldness predicted whether individuals in these two troops of baboons um, would uh, whether personality would predict whether they would learn about this, um, not that this novel food was edible. So to do this, I did an experiment in the wild. I had two conditions. The first was a control condition where I gave um, an individual access to the novel food on two occasions to test what they would do um, in response to that novel food. So most of the baboons actually don't eat novel foods. They will um, investigate it, uh, but, won't, uh, but won't do very much more than that. In the treatment condition, I gave them some social information. So I gave individuals um, the novel food. I then gave them an opportunity to learn from another individual who would eat the food that the food was edible. And then I tested them again to see um, what they would do after they had had that social information. And I'm going to show you a little video, um, I hope, <laughs> to explain what this looks like. So this is these are the control conditions. So we have an individual here who is smelling the novel food. This is the first presentation. I then test that individual again. This is the second presentation. Um, then this is another control. Um, so this individual interacted with the food but didn't eat it. And this is the second time that I've presented it to this individual. And here's an example of the treatment. So this individual, you can't even see the food there, um, but I promise that she's just walked past it. She didn't interact with it at all. She saw it, but didn't interact with it. I then give her an opportunity to approach this individual who is eating the novel food. And you can see that she goes straight to her and, um, and smells her lips and also what she's uh, got in her hand and sits there and collects social information about um, what this individual is eating. I then present that food to her again so that um, to see what she's doing with that food. Okay. And this is what it looks like when it comes out. So this is a bit of a complicated graph that I'm going to walk through, um, uh, walk through slowly. So we have two panels that represents the control and the treatment. Um, so in one case, the control, there was no social information provided. And in the second case, there was social information provided. Each of the controls have two sets of bars. One set of bars is for the bold individuals in the population. So those are individuals who are likely to eat the, the food on the first um, or interact with the food longer when they first uh, get, uh, get an opportunity to interact with it. And then the second are the shy, the ones that are unlikely to or uh, less likely to interact with the food when they first encounter it. And then each of those sets of bars is broken into two bars representing presentation one and presentation two. Now, the important thing to note in this is that um, the bold individuals had a change in their behavior between the presentations. So in the control condition, bold individuals decreased what the amount of time that they spent with the novel food. And in the treatment condition, they increased the amount of time that they, um, that they handled that novel food. And the important thing is that the shy individuals didn't change their behavior at all. So it didn't matter that they had gotten um, social information. They still did the same thing on the second presentation. So this suggests that bold individuals learn socially and prioritize social information, whereas shy individuals do not. And this has implications for how um, information transmits through the group, um, which could also have conservation implications. For example, if you want individuals to learn about a novel predator, um, some individuals or my data suggests that some individuals aren't going to learn socially um, about that uh, predator. So that sums up my very brief introduction to um, animal personality research. And I'm super excited to listen to the talks of my uh, colleagues um, here. I'm assured that Lewis does not look like a Siamang, um, but he's also going to, but he will tell us about uh, Siamang uh, behavior. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm very happy to um, take any questions.
Thank you very much, Alicia. That is a fantastic start to the evening. Uh, and of course, uh, super happy to see the baboons. <laughs> so uh, before I, uh, I go any further, um, I just wanted to uh, share my screen again so that our audience can uh, see again where to send their questions. Um, it will just take a moment or two, I'm sure, before the questions start coming in. So just as a reminder to everyone, uh, you can either submit a question at our Pigeonhole webpage, which is available at www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931, or you can use the QR code on the screen, or you can email us at scientific events, scientific .events at zsl.org, sorry, and, uh, and uh, we'll do that for you. Uh, okay, so uh, I think uh, coming back, uh, Alicia, um, let me see, uh, let me just see what questions are coming up here, first of all. Okay, the first question is, because personality implies individual differences, can it be easy to apply these observations to animal groups or populations? That was a really good question. Um, some people have argued, yes, that, that it's possible to have um, group personalities. Uh, and there's been some controversial research uh, published around this idea. There's also a related idea that, um, that some individuals have such an effect on their group, they're called keystone individuals, that they can change the entire behavior in the group, which is, I guess, um, your question, but turned on its head a little bit. So the, the short answer is um, there is some evidence or some studies that try to, to get at that idea that um, groups or populations can behave differently. Um, but the jury is a bit out on it at the moment. But great question. Yeah. Great, thank you, Alicia. The next question, uh, we've got two more that have come in. Uh, make that three. <laughs> um, can you see personality traits that run in families of baboons? <laughs> Subjectively, yes, <laughs> but objectively, it's actually really hard. I haven't, um, to, to be able to do those kinds of analyses, I need lots and lots and lots of data. And although we have a lot of baboons, it's, there is um, more variation in the, in the responses. Um, so, well, there's a lot of variation in the responses, meaning that I need a very large sample size to be able to get anything out of it. But if you ask some of our observers, um, there will be, for example, matriline, so groups of like mothers and their offspring, who we all know have a particular um, personality trait, be it good or bad. Um, so subjectively, off the record, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we've got time for, uh, well, let's see, two very quick answers are going to be needed here. First question is, how do you measure boldness in wild apes? <laughs> Lots of different ways. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if anybody's done boldness studies in apes, but there are lots of monkey studies where we, we give them um, uh, objects to interact with. So novel objects on novel foods, or um, you can do a playback experiment, for example, to record um, what they uh, do in response. But I can't think of any that have done it on wild apes. Um, it's a good question. Uh, um, sorry, last question then. I'm just going to sneak in very quickly. How did you differentiate between boldness and dominance? Uh, so I tested individuals when they were not with other individuals so that the dominance didn't play a fact, play a role. But I have also um, checked in my analyses to see whether dominance predicts boldness and it doesn't. So it seems to be um, completely, well, at, with the data that I have at hand, independent of their dominance. I hope that answers that question. That was great. Thank you so <laughs> much, Alicia. So we'll come back to you later in the evening um, after we finished all the presentations. But in the meantime, I'm now going to move on to our next presenter, who is Felicity Delem. I hope I got the pronunciation right there, Felicity. Perfect. Great. Okay, so um, Felicity comes from the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries in Germany, and also from the Bimini Biological Field Station in the Bahamas. And uh, well, uh, under Alice, Felicity's description here, uh, I initially begin with a description of, of lemon sharks, um, which are uh, apparently gorgeous yellow predators uh, that inhabit the coastal waters of the American continent. Um, but most importantly, for, for the present purposes, they are also one of Felicity's obsessions, uh, together with horses, bicycles, boats, and white pizza. 
Felicity started her scientific career at Bamini in the Bahamas in 2013, testing the meaning of the famous personality test, the novel open field test on juvenile lemon sharks. This endeavor soon transformed into a PhD project, which she conducted from 2015 to 2020. Felicity recently graduated and now works on the spatial behavior of pike in the Baltic Sea. Felicity will be talking to us tonight about captive personality and wild behavior in sharks. How can personality inform conservation? Over to you, Felicity. All right, thank you very much, Guy, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm hoping you guys can hear me. Um, my name is Felicity Delem. That was very well pronounced. I'm super happy to be here. And um, yeah, the goal tonight is to discuss whether we can um, use animal personality as a tool to improve conservation. And I think one thing that is primordial to answer this question is to know that actually personality can predict the way an animal will live. Otherwise, there's really no point in using it as a tool. And Alicia already showed some example of how animal personality may impact the way baboons live, for example. And there's many theories that make us think that, yes, animal personality can predict what an animal will do and how it will live. And one of my favorite one, one of my favorite theory is the one that links personality to what's called pace of life. Very briefly, this theory says that if you're looking at a group of animals, for example, a group of birds, you will see that some are always more explorative than the others. And that's what personality is. Now, what you might realize is that the more explorative ones are better at finding more food. For example, they explore more different habitats or they go further from where they normally live. And so because they encounter more food, they're going to grow faster. But while they're exploring so much, they might not be as vigilant as the least explorative uh, conspecifics, and they might also run into more predators, in which case um, they will have a shorter life. And I love this theory because I find it very uh, intuitive. I find, it, I find that it makes a lot of sense. But surprisingly, we, the scientific community, have been very bad at proving that this is true. And to this day, we don't actually know whether um, it is fully true. And one reason why uh, this has been a challenge, I think, is because we're missing a key piece of the story. So, and to explain this to you, I want to say that if a researcher wants to study personality and gets given the choice between doing it in little fish that they can keep in an aquarium or doing it on wild bears, they will soon find out that the least costly option and the most efficient one is to work on the fish and just stay home and install all the fish in your apartment and then uh, problem solved. So most of, the, most of what we know about personality comes from captive experiments, although wild experiments do exist. But when you want to look at the growth or the survival of an animal, of course, this is a lot more meaningful to do in the wild. And so in order to really know if personality impacts something like growth and survival, you really need to take into account the link between those two, which is going to be the wild behavior. So a couple of years ago, we decided to uh, investigate this exact issue using uh, juvenile lemon sharks. These are the sharks on this picture. Uh, and when I say we decided to do it is because the work that I'm presenting uh, tonight is not just my work. I've been uh, collaborating with some of the smartest people I know, uh, my co-authors and my students. And because it was quite labor intensive, we were really lucky to be supported by over 100 interns and uh, 28 staff members at the Bimini Biological Field Stations. So in order to find our missing link, we did three things. The first thing we did was um, we went to Bimini, of course, that's where the Bimini Biological Field Station is. Um, Bimini is an island in the Bahamas that's 80 kilometers away roughly from Miami. And uh, Bimini is the home of juvenile lemon sharks. So lemon sharks are born there and they will stay there until they turn three to five years old. So we were interested in two main populations of lemon sharks. One, one of them is called North Sound in yellow and the other one is Sharkland. And there is one main difference between those two populations is that there's a lot more predators uh, for the lemon sharks 
in Sharkland. And the life of a baby lemon shark is very much linked to the mangroves, which are those trees that um, grow in the water. They have their roots in the water and their roots provide a very good refuge for little sharks to escape from their bigger predators. Uh, it's very shallow, it's very nice, but little lemon sharks also have the opportunity to go offshore, of course, where it is deeper, but they might be not as well protected, so they will find, um, they will encounter a lot more predators. But there is a payoff to going offshore because the prey of the lemon shark are also very good at hiding within the mangrove roots, and so lemon sharks are a lot better at hunting when they are offshore. So you could imagine that a shark that goes offshore is growing faster than the one that stays inshore and has a lower survival. And this is great. This is a great uh, setup for experiment because it looks like this might be uh, our missing link. So every year we went and we captured juvenile lemon sharks. This is a campaign that has been going on since 1993 using gill nets, as you can see on this picture. And uh, we fished for 12 nights, and every time a shark was caught, we stored it in those enclosures that we built directly into the, um, into the sea. And of course, over time, we're fishing, and we fish more and more, and we catch more and more shark, and so we're catching less and less um, over time. And at the end, we're barely catching anything, and we can uh, safely say that we've captured over 99% of the population. The first time a shark is caught, it is of course measured, but very importantly, it receives a transponder, which is the same people have in cats and dogs. And that allows us to know um, the identity of this shark for many years to come. So the next year, when we go fishing again, if that shark is missing and it's not of an age at which it should have gone away, we can say that it has died. Um, and if it, has been recaptured, we're able to look at its growth rate. So this is already providing us with data to look at the first piece of our puzzle. We wanted to know if the sharks that grow faster are more likely to die in Bimini. And here is a part of the result that I'm going to walk you through. So here is the result for North Sound, and those are the sharks that have died, and those ones here are the ones that have stayed alive and the ones that have died grew faster um, on average than the ones that stayed alive. So the hypothesis was true, or this relationship was true. And this was also the case in Sharkland, a little less so, but this was still significant as indicated by uh, this significant star. So that was great. We already had um, evidence that growth and mortality or survival were linked in, um, in Bimini. Now, at the end of our capture campaign, we had all of these strikes in captivity, so we took advantage of it to run a captive personality test. And this is an aerial picture of what our office looked like for one month every year. That was very lovely. Um, and the novel open field test is quite similar to what Alicia showed with um, animals that are presented with a novel object, but instead sharks were presented with a place that they've never been, which is this um, rectangle enclosure. So we just observed their exploration behavior during 10 minutes in the enclosure. And this was found to be repeatable. Repeatable just means that, yeah, sharks were consistent over time and we were indeed looking at a personality trait. With this data in hand, we could already ask, is personality going to uh, predict the growth of the shark? Once we release them at the end of the experiment, we release all the shark and then we can recapture them the next year and see if they've grown a lot or not. Um, so we wanted to know if personality was linked to growth. And here's the data we collected in the North Sound. So on this axis here is the exploration score. And the more the sharks were exploring, the uh, bigger they grew, the faster they grew. So this relationship here was true, but in Sharkland, all of the sharks were growing at different rates and that had nothing to do with how they scored in the personality test. So this relationship did no longer happen. And we thought that it was because of our missing link. It's because personality was no longer representative of what a shark was doing in the wild. So we went and decided, of course, to um, record the distance that the sharks were swimming from the shore. 
And in order to do that, we used a technique called acoustic telemetry. Uh, in acoustic telemetry, we inserted those, uh, those are called acoustic tags inside the body cavity of the sharks doing a little surgery. And this stays in the shark for the rest of its life. And then thanks to this, we can just go and use our boats, look and listen actually for the sharks and we can locate them everywhere around the island. And this is an example of the data that we've acquired after four years of tracking. Uh, every single dot on this map is a place where we found a shark. And of course, with all of these dots, we're able to calculate the distance that the sharks were swimming away from the shore. We did that on 52 sharks. Um, so the question, of course, was do sharks that explore a lot in these captive personality tests, um, are they found further away from shore? And here is what we found. So um, on this axis, the exploration score, these are the sharks that explore a lot. And in North Sound, the sharks that explored a lot in captivity were found further from shore. They were found around 150 meters away from shore. And the ones that didn't explore so much were found closer to shore. So this was great. This was uh, supporting the hypothesis. But in Sharkland, no matter the exploration score that they, they had in captivity, all of the sharks were found close to the shore. In turn, of course, this um, impacted the mortality of the animals. Uh, sharks that went away from shore in North Sound were more likely to die than the ones that um, stayed close to the shore. But in Sharkland, because everyone was close to the shore, the likelihoods of dying were uh, very similar between the two groups. So in summary, what we found is that in the presence of very few predators, sharks that explore little are found close to the shore and they grow very slowly, but they last very long in time. Whereas if they explore more in captivity, they're found further away from shore and they grow faster, but they might not last as long, which is exactly what we expected from the theory, the, the theoretical approaches. However, when many predators were present, and those are our little predators here, all of the sharks were staying close to the shore. And so um, personality was no longer linked to what you can expect an animal to do, a shark to do. And this link between the personality, the wild behavior, and the growth and survival was no longer existent. So this, this experiment didn't exactly test whether we could use personality for conservation. But if, if I wanted to use um, this personality test for, to conserve the juvenile lemon sharks, I would obviously have to use a trick because the personality that I measured is not always meaningful for what my sharks are doing. So we would need to find either a way to measure personality differently in the wild, for example, directly using um, telemetry rather than going through a test, and or we would need to understand a lot better when is personality meaningful for these sharks, um, under which circumstances can we ex expect personality to predict what the sharks are going to do. And I think that is my time. Hey, stay tuned if you want to hear an uh, amazing talk by Vix and Lewis on more personality stuff. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Felicity. That was a fantastic talk. Really, really fantastic study system. So um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, the first question that's come in is, uh, asking if you could say a little bit more about the behavioral indicators of personality in sharks. So, for example, uh, do they explore differently from each other? So, yes. Actually, that's not really true. The, the part that we've looked at when we were looking at the uh, exploration of shark is rate of movement. So it's basically how much they explore. They're not necessarily using different behaviors to explore they just go further or uh, make longer trips uh, to explore, but they don't really have, uh, some sharks might be able to stop and stare at things. Those sharks can't, they're just mostly swimming. So um, yeah, you're just looking at the distance they cover. Okay, great. And um, last question, um, the, uh, the, the, member, the audience member has said, uh, this is very interesting research. 
and thanks for your excellent talk. Um, has similar research been carried out on other species of shark? Yes, um, there has been some, some research on shark personality on small spotted cat sharks and poor Jackson sharks from what I know. And those are sharks that are super interesting because they're benthic. Um, yeah, you say benthic, right? Benthic, so yeah. they, they, they sit on the bottom and they're actually very, a very different animal from the lemon shark. So I think we gain a lot of understanding of shark personality by going through uh, a lot of different species like that. Okay, brilliant. Well, um, we're going to keep, to keep on schedule, Felicia. I'm going to uh, stop there, but we'll definitely come back to you at the end of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker tonight is Victoria Franks. So Victoria is a behavioral ecologist who's interested in understanding how animals' behavioral responses to changing environments can help better inform their conservation. During her PhD, which Victoria completed jointly between the University of Cambridge and ZSL between 2014 and 2019, she explored the importance of early life social experiences for behavior and conservation in Hihi, a threatened New Zealand bird. She has continued to work with Hihi since her PhD and is currently collaborating with ZSL to understand the factors which impact on their reintroduction outcomes. She is also currently a lecturer in animal behavior at the University of Chester. In her presentation tonight, Victoria will be asking the question, how can considering individual differences inform reintroductions? Over to you, Victoria. Thank you. Thanks very much, Guy. I'll get my screen shared for everyone. Okay, so hi all, thanks very much for listening in. Um, and tonight I'm going to be talking about how we can understand individual differences during reintroductions and how this might inform our conservation management in threatened species. So firstly, I'd like to thank all these people and organizations that you can see on the screen now. Um, research is always a team effort as we've heard already, I think, and that's even more of the case when I'm not just going to be talking about some of my own work today, but also um, a fab study by some of the other members of the wider HEHE research group. So I'm going to begin by introducing the main topic here um, for my talk, which is reintroductions. So reintroductions occur when we move animals from one location to another with the aim of establishing a population in areas where this species has become extinct. So they are an essential conservation tool because they're often the only way that a threatened species can recolonize areas of their previous ranges. And some classic examples of reintroductions include red kites in the UK and gray wolves in Yellowstone. However, reintroductions are nevertheless pretty challenging for the animals involved. And they're almost like alien abductions where an animal is suddenly removed from where it's living and abruptly transported to a completely new and unknown site. And reintroduction success or failure is ultimately determined by whether the animals can establish a viable self-sustaining population. And two key processes here are their survival post-release and also their dispersal in the first few years following reintroduction. So what do I mean by this? Well, if we consider this population of birds I've got on the screen, first of all, we catch some individuals to be reintroduced to a new site and then release them to start a new population. They need to be able to find food and adjust to their new home quite quickly. And actually not all animals will do this successfully, meaning that some will die and be lost from this new population. And as time goes on, some animals might disperse out of this new population and this might be immediately following release or as new animals are born and are trying to find their own territories. Um, so because of this reintroduction and then both the su survival and dispersal, we end up with individual birds being sort of filtered out across the reintroduction. So what, which individuals remain in the reintroduced population? As we've been hearing already, there are consequences of a whole suite of different personality traits. So the question we might want to ask here is, who are the individuals who manage to survive and stay in a population? Maybe they have particular personality traits that could mean that they're better able to cope with this reintroduction process. 
And I'm going to talk about two studies to show how we can test for individual level differences during reintroductions to be able to understand the value of this variation through its influences on both post-release survival and also dispersal. So the first uh, study I'm going to use is an example from my own PhD research, but the second study is an earlier study uh, from Dr. Kate Richardson, who you can see on the screen here as well. So I'm just going to introduce our study species briefly, and this lovely little bird is the hihi, and it's a New Zealand songbird. Now, hihi are a threatened species which are vulnerable to extinction. And one reason for this is that they have a massively reduced remnant range, and they actually became restricted to just one offshore island after humans arrived in New Zealand. However, reintroductions are a major focus of hihi conservation, and there are currently six reintroduced populations across the North Island. And I'm actually going to talk about two of these populations today, or two reintroductions of these populations today. So for study one, uh, we're going to consider the influence of individual differences in sociability on post-release survival. And why are we thinking about sociability here? Well, uh, variation in social behavior, as Alicia's kind of mentioned already, is one of the key axes of personality. However, the social environment is disrupted by reintroductions to, thanks to that selective process I mentioned earlier. And there is some evidence that more social animals may survive better following population disruptions. So how does this work in the specific context of reintroductions? And do we find that individuals who survive exhibit particular predictable sociable temperaments? So in 2017, we moved 40 juvenile hihi from one of our main populations on Tiritiri Matangi Island, and we set up a new population at a site called Rotokari Scenic Reserve. And to investigate the importance of sociability, we first needed to know which juveniles were more sociable before the reintroduction. And young hihi tend to form groups after they leave their parents, and this makes them quite easy to observe. And also every individual is color banded, so we can then record the identities of which birds are flocking together with who. And using the observations I collected, I built what is known as a social network to show which he he grouped together. And essentially, uh, in these diagrams, if two birds were seen in the same flock, they get connected together by a line. And by building up repeated observations over time, we can then determine how many other birds each individual ever associated with in these flocking groups. So for example, this individual I've highlighted here has associated with six other birds, uh, in contrast to this individual who only has ever had one associate. And then once it was time for the reintroduction, we caught the 40 juveniles and moved them to their new home. And we could then re-observe birds after release and basically re-record a social network to look at um, what happened before and after reintroduction. And, and I then looked at whether there was individual consistency in the sociability before versus afterwards. And if individuals were consistent in their social behavior, we might expect birds who were the most social before reintroduction to also be the most social afterwards. And this is even if the precise number of associates was changing. So you can see with this blue bird I've got here that it's the most social before reintroduction with six associates. And then it also has the most associates um, after reintroduction compared to all the other birds in the population. However, what we found in reality was that for reintroduced hihi, and also for a set of birds which were left behind in the source site, which we used for basically a comparison, um, that sociability wasn't consistent for these individuals any more than you might expect by random chance. So here, a bird that was maybe ranked at the top with the most associates, could perhaps drop to being one of the least sociable after the reintroduction happened. Now, even though sociability wasn't consistent across this reintroduction, I still considered what this mixing up of social environments meant for survival. And we monitor survival of individuals after reintroduction anyway to check how the new population is doing. So we knew how long each bird survived in this new site. And overall, I found that birds that gained associates were the ones that were most likely to survive. So this study has shown how individual effects are important to consider, firstly, to establish whether they are consistent and then to determine how they influence reintroductions, even if they might not be. 
um, as it helps us to understand what's going on during the reintroductions and whether we can predict how individuals are going to fare after a release. And I'm going to briefly talk through the second study from HeHe he Research now, and this is by Kate Richardson. She looked at a different behavioral temperament, and this is reactivity, or basically how he, he responded to an unusual situation. And um, then also looked at how it linked to dispersal in an establishing reintroduced population. So how animals react to unusual situations or their risk taking and their boldness have all been linked to how animals cope and colonize when they're in novel environments. And this has actually mostly been studied in invasion ecology. So this is when we've accidentally introduced animals we don't actually want to be there. Um, but it's also important to consider in reintroductions as well. And this is during establishments, so when the, po the population is starting to get itself going. So the study population I'm talking about now is a reintroduced population at a place called Sanctuary Mountain in Mongotaltari. And he, he were reintroduced here from two different populations between 2009 and 2011. And in the years following these initial reintroductions, the new population bred, and so Kate could look at the dispersal patterns of those first sets of offspring who were from the original release found founders. And each juvenile was caught as part of the population monitoring, and this is so we can collect vital data on the birds, and it's so we can also fit birds with the plastic leg rings that we use to identify them. And this handling basically provided an opportunity to be able to assess the reactivity of these birds when they're otherwise free living and wild. So during capture, Kate recorded a score for each individual, which measured its reaction to being handled. And this was either from zero, where they didn't struggle at all, to one, where they struggled but had no distress call, and then two where um, they both struggled and emitted a distress call at the same time. And through a lot of intensive monitoring, um, oops, sorry, um, the natal hatching sites of each juvenile was already known. And then once they'd left the nest and dispersed and set up their own territories, Kate also found them again and recorded where these new uh, territory sites were. So this meant that she could basically determine each bird's natal dispersal distance so this is how far they'd moved from their birth site before establishing their own territory. And she then explored whether the temperament during handling, so from those handling scores that she collected, were linked to how far individual juveniles dispersed. And she found that it was uh, for male juvenile hee hee. So this graph shows the average dispersal distances depending on each bird's handling score from zero to two. And what this basically means is that birds that scored uh, zero, if they were male, they dispersed an average of a thousand meters. But birds that were in that category two, so they both struggle, struggled and distress called during their handling, they dispersed about four times that distance on average. And again, this is just thinking about the males, there wasn't this same pattern in the females. But essentially, these findings show how behavioral differences between individuals might affect their dispersal patterns. And this in turn may influence the probability that animals will either stay in the population, um, but it also dictates potentially the spatial configuration that you're going to have in these reintroduced populations. And that's basically where animals are within that physical environment. So to just sum up this kind of whistle-stop tour of some hee-hee research then, we can test for individual differences across reintroductions. And by assessing those differences repeatedly at different stages of the reintroduction, we can start to understand whether there is consistency in individual temperaments. Now, these differences might have consequences for both survival and dispersal. And even if traits actually turn out not to be particularly consistent, this is still important to know for reintroductions that helps us better understand outcomes and then plan for the future. So for example, um, we might actually want to reintroduce a mix of personalities if they maybe do better at different stages of a reintroduction, or we might want to adjust that mix depending on the challenges of long versus short-term uh, reintroduction success. So I'd just like to finish by saying thank you very much for listening and I'll gladly take any questions. Thank you very much, Victoria. That was a fantastic talk. So um, I think we've got time just for one quick question for now, um, which is,
do you believe you would be better off purposefully introducing a variety of personality types, especially if there are unknowns at the release site that could affect survival? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And that was kind of what I was thinking about at the end there when I was summing, summarizing um, what I was talking about. So it, I guess the, it depends slightly potentially on the outcomes that you want during your reintroduction, because maybe if you've got um, individuals that you need them to spread out across a site or you need them to stay very localized, then perhaps choosing animals based on their personality, which aren't going to disperse, that might um, be beneficial then. Um, but yes, in other cases, if you want them to be sort of like more equally spread out across the site, maybe having a mix of bold and shy animals might be better in that case. So I could see I could see situations where it might work both ways. And it's always so complicated with the situations that arise in the introductions. OK, great. Thank you, Victoria. We will definitely come back to you for the panel discussion shortly. But for now, I would like to introduce our last speaker of the evening, who is Lewis Rowden. So Lewis is the Zoo Research Officer for ZSL, who works within the evidence-based animal care team across both London and Whipsnade zoos. So uh, the work that he does within this team is applying scientific principles that inform care and conservation associated with zoo activities. Lewis is also a PhD student in behavioral neuroscience at the Sainsbury's Wellcome Centre at University College London. With a background as a zookeeper, and a research masters focusing on primate personality, Lewis is interested in how the study of this behavioral science, amongst other fields, can be applied to the conservation and care of zoo house species. So tonight, Lewis will be talking on the application of personality assessment to ex situ conservation and management. Take it away, Lewis. Thanks very much, Guy. Um, and yeah, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so, so yeah, my um, following the really brilliant talks we've already had this evening, um, my presentation is going to focus on how we can use our understanding of animal personality uh, in an attempt to inform our best practice care and zoo conservation and management more broadly. So I'll start with a very brief uh, snapshot, I guess, of literature that's shown previous applications of personality work in the zoo, and then go on to talk about a few more specific case studies that we've been involved with. Um, so so as, Go, as Guy was saying, my role at ZSL sits within the evidence-based animal care team. So um, we're very lucky that science is such a, such a um, priority at ZSL and, and personality research is just one aspect of behaviour information that we can use to inform how we uh, best care for our animals and also contribute, contribute to our zoo-based uh, conservation programmes. So um, in general, um, Zoos are really great places to perhaps learn about the theoretical um, basis of animal personality. Um, but tonight I'm going to focus more about how we can use uh, quantified personality in individuals and then use that information to inform care. So when we're thinking about applications, I think we can broadly think about things on, on two main levels. So firstly, um, not surprisingly, because uh, you know we, we understand that there's this individual basis to personality, um, a lot of the work that's previously been done in zoos looks at how personality can inform individual animal care. So, for example, um, there's been evidence to show that the behavioural management, so things like uh, positive reinforcement training and enrichment programmes that take place in zoo are affected by personality. So uh, there's a snow leopard example where it showed that snow leopards with different personalities engage with enrichment items in more or less successful ways. Um, equally, we know that the human element of a zoo, so keepers and the uh, interactions that they have with animals, are really important for animal welfare. Um, and there's evidence in tigers that the personality of a tiger um, means that they interact with their keepers in different ways. And thinking more about this sociality aspect, um, animals that are housed in groups in zoos, uh, such as gorillas and elephants, um, there's evidence that personality of these individual animals affect social interactions and compatibility as groups as well. Um, and more recently in rhesus macaques, there's evidence to show that personality types um, actually make individuals more or less susceptible to um, injury and abnormal health, which is really useful information to have when we're considering our proactive veterinary programs. Um, and then obviously the sort of converse of the individual level is thinking about on a population level in zoos. 
So as many of you will know, um, the animal populations that we have in zoos are managed um, on either a regional or sometimes global level um, to maintain genetic diversity and a nice, healthy, sustainable population. Um, so this often is uh, involves breeding transfer recommendations and movements between zoos based on information like uh, genetic relatedness and demographics. Um, but there's been a lot of nice uh, literature reviews published over the last um, decade or so that show that actually um, the personality of individual animals within these populations um, affects breeding success and therefore the conservation potential of the populations as a whole. Um, and some of the earliest work that was done in, in zoos with personality was looking at breeding success and personality in black rhino and cheetah populations. Um, and more recently in this uh, furrow wood turtle in America as a part of a reintroduction program. So um, it, you probably noticed from those examples that primates feature quite heavily in, um, in zoo-based uh, personality work. Um, and, and other literature reviews have shown that that's the case, that primates are probably the, are the most studied uh, taxonomic order when it comes to this field of research. So um, Guy and myself recently supervised a wild animal biology student uh, at the ZSL and RBC master's course, um, and they were able to carry out a literature review over the last 10 years, looking at potential ways that personality information could be or has been applied to inform the management of non-human primates. Um, and so that was published last year. So just some key take home points, I guess, to give you the context of, of where we're at with primate personality. Um, this was following some similar work that had been published in 2010. Um, and what we see is a very similar trend in a taxonomic bias. So within the primate order, we see that there's definitely a skew towards certain species of primate being studied. And in fact, in this recent paper, we can see that almost 50% of all of the primate studies um, actually were just based on two genera of primates, so macaques, which were predominantly rhesus macaques, and also chimpanzees. So overall, we've still got less than 10% of primate species in existence that have had personality work um, as their focus. So other than that taxonomic bias, um, the main aims of the majority of the projects carried out were validating new methodologies rather than focusing on how information could be applied. Um, and zoos were the most common setting for these research projects. So 39% compared to uh, lower proportions for places like laboratories or in-field studies. So, so that sets the scene generally for um, how research has happened uh, with personality in primates. Um, so jumping, jumping back in time, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit now about some case studies of projects that I've specifically worked on. Um, so four years ago now, I started uh, two projects that looked at personality um, assessment in two populations of threatened primate species maintained in European zoos. So we have the Simon Gibbon on your left and the Sulawesi crested bat macaque on your right. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna focus on the Simon Gibbons this evening. Um, so for a bit of background to the species um, and how they're kept in European zoos. So they're generally housed um, as monogamous breeding pairs or small family groups. Um, and at the time of the project, they were held across 48 institutions um, and there were just under 200 individuals in the population. So the aim of the project um, was initially, or well, the main aims were initially to determine whether we could actually um, and confidently identify personality in this species, because um, as we saw in the pie chart earlier, um, there had not been any previous personality work at all with Gibbons. Um, and then secondly, we were interested to see whether the information on personality had any relationship with the reproductive success of individuals within the population. So to get the personality data itself, um, we used uh, the, something called the Hominoid Personality Questionnaire, which is a standard uh, methodology that's been used quite a lot in various different primate studies and zoos. And essentially it's a survey that consists of a list of 60 traits with some examples you can see um, in the middle of the slide there, um, each with a description for consistency. And then that goes, that, question, that survey goes to the zoos that hold the species and we request that multiple keepers who are familiar with the individuals they're looking after um, complete, complete the survey and rank each individual animal on each of the traits 
um, on this one to seven sliding scale. So similar to what Alicia was saying in her introduction, where you have one is a total absence of the trait and seven is that they display the trait extremely frequently. So that's how we obtained personality data from the population. Um, we were very lucky that we got a response from 50% of the holders. Um, so uh, ended up having numbers just under 100 animals. Um, and we were able to confidently um, identify then three personality domains. And domains are just groups of these traits that sort of make sense and go together. Um, and in the Simon Gibbons, these were um, excitable, dominant, and introverted. So now that we had those personality domains, we wanted to look at the relationship with reproductive success in the population. Um, and these two graphs sort of show the trend in that. So you can see we have a plot for male on the left and females on the right, um, with reproductive success plotted against the domain scores they had for each of those three domains, um, with excitable in the red, um, dominant in the blue, and introverted in the green. And the results that we found for both sexes of, of Gibbon was that um, individual animals that had higher scores for the dominant domain, but lower scores for excitable and introverted actually had higher reproductive success scores. So this is really helpful for a management perspective because it means um, we now have a suggestion that personality does affect reproductive success in the species. Um, and also we can use this personality data now alongside the other factors like genetic relatedness and demographics to make more informed EEP or breeding program transfer recommendations. So for example, if we had individual animals um, that haven't bred successfully before and are particularly genetically valuable, we can make sure uh, that they are paired with an animal that has a compatible personality to maximize the chances of reproductive success. Um, and what's been great as well is that um, there were some other researchers, researchers using the same tool to collect personality data of various given species across the world. Um, and now we're able to contribute all of this together to, um, to look at a general given health and welfare in managed populations. Um, and just to finish off, so that it's not uh, trying to address some of the tax of bias with primates, um, it's not just primates that we look at personality with in the zoo. So in a separate study, we were looking at behavior of these red knee tarantulas in response to routine management. So for example, moving between enclosures, and we'd noticed that there were some assemblages of individual differences in behavioral response. So now we're looking at a more structured personality project to see whether individual responses of spiders to, to keeper handling are an aspect of personality. So we can think about using these novel object tests or perhaps timing response to food item presentation um, and see if we can score these spiders on a bold shy continuum that we've heard about throughout the evening. So just a very quick in conclusion summary, um, animal personality research in the zoo is definitely a growing area of study. And I think it's really one that has a lot of exciting potential application for the future. Um, so I'd just like to thank all of the collaborators for all the projects that we've um, that I've talked about, um, especially Dr. Kathy Baker, who first introduced me to personality work. And of course, all of the zoos and keepers who responded to the questionnaires because this sort of work is only possible on that population level with that in effect um, and just an excuse to have a macaque picture again. Thank you very much for listening and happy to answer any questions. Brilliant, thank you very much, Lewis. So uh, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, the first question is that it's good to see a standard methodology for studying personality traits in primates but are there similar standardized approaches for other taxa in captive populations? Yes, yes. So there are the hominoid personality question I mentioned is probably the most commonly used for primates, but there are similar scales for primate species as well. Um, and there are similar questionnaires that have been developed for um, more of a mammalian taxa, I think. So the big cats, especially, and the elephants use a similar questionnaire survey. Um, and then I think uh, most often other attacks are investigated using things like the novel object testing um, and, and other behavior tests. But it would be quite interesting to see if we could pick up the personality traits through, through the trait scoring questionnaire as well for those taxa. And uh, similarly on a methodological theme, 
how do 60 descriptors become three domains? Yes, through some nice uh, bit of statistical analysis called a principal component analysis. So effectively, with the multiple observers scoring the different traits for each animal, we have a range of traits that we uh, produce of a compiled score for each animal. Um, and then all of those compiled scores go together into this principal component analysis. And that tells us um, which groupings best explain the variation that we see in the data. So, uh, so the, yeah, so the traits that match up best and explain the data go together in these domains. And that's the sort of unit that we look at then in terms of a personality. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to I just draw a close to our questions for you there, Lewis, so that I can bring our other speakers back. Um, I think the first thing I need to do is bring back uh, also my uh, screen just to provide everyone with a reminder uh, where they can post their questions. So um, this is the last time you're going to see this slide, I hope, but uh, please do uh, send your questions to us via pigeonhole at www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931 or email them to us at scientific.events at zsl.org. Okay, so, um, oh, and the other thing I was going to also add is um, if there are others, other questions from others that, that you would particularly like to see asked, then do upvote those questions so that we can make sure that we ask our panel those questions. Okay, so let me uh, just take us back to uh, this, our speakers tonight. Um, now, um, I think, uh, let me just see what questions we have coming in here. If you just give me a moment. Um, so this is for Lewis. If dominance generally increases the chances of successful mating, would it increase the successful in introverted individual to pair them with another introvert or a more dominant animal? Yeah, so that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, it's something that's quite difficult to test experimentally because, as you can imagine, these gibbons are spread all across Europe. It's not something we could we could move around um, to test as easily. Um, in the black rhino research I mentioned, they did find that differences in personality scores were the thing that predicted reproductive success. Um, so I, I yeah I plan to do a bit more on data analysis um, and obviously as well because the species is so its system of reproduction is so based on a successful pair. I'm going to look at ways at, uh, of scoring pair personality rather than just individuals to see if, if that explains the situation uh, with a bit more detail. But yeah, definitely it would be interesting to see if those combinations make any difference. Cool. OK, next question for Victoria. Do you think that assessing personality in hee like you've done can be extrapolated to other taxa such as reptiles and amphibians? Yeah. Um... I definitely think hope well hope that it would be during sort of reintroductions and I think we've heard a little bit from the others about how um, it, it has been applied in other taxa already. Um, one thing I didn't touch on in my talk is another study from Kate where she was actually testing um, exploratory and, and boldness and she had basically like a little box that she was put, putting the hee hee in during the reintroduction and seeing how they move through that so I think something set up like that could also be used across definitely a variety of taxa, like hopefully reptiles, and it's not just uh, those charismatic animals for sure. Okay, uh, could I ask a question to you, Felicity? Um, are there any other aspects of sharp personality that have been looked at other than exploration? Yes, they have. Um... In our study system in Lemon Track, we actually spent a lot of time also studying sociability and how, because um, Lemon Tracks are social, so how social information goes through them. I just haven't had time to talk about it, but yes, we do study other stuff. Okay. Um, so, Lewis, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about the Sulawesi macaque study that you briefly touched on? I would be very happy to, they are my favourites. So um, yes, yeah, so we use exactly the same questionnaire, um, again, across the European zoo population. Um, but it was lucky that um, there were data available on the same assessment from 10 years previously. So it gave us the opportunity to look 
at testing this sort of temporal stability that Alicia mentioned as being a key, you know, key component of personality. So is that stable over time? And again, trying to look at some of the inheritance or heritability of personality within the population, because, you know, are we unintentionally um, having a population that has a certain personality type and how does that affect conservation potential? But um, yeah, again, as Alicia mentioned, it was difficult with the sample size, um, but was, yeah, so again, more data crunching, but that was the aim of that project. So hopefully that will give some nice, useful information. Well, hopefully you'll be able to come back and uh, tell us your findings. Yeah, maybe. Give me a year or so, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so uh, this is a general question for anyone who might like to take it. So the question is, what environmental differences might account for changes in sociability? Shall I, shall I grab that one, seeing as it was kind of related to what I was talking about? Um, so aspects that we think might be important for the HEHE, um, using them as an example to begin with, is um, resource availability. So we think that actually their aggregations form, it seems to be um, primarily sort of around the water sources on, on the islands where we study them. Um, so, I mean, in that term, if, if a trait such as sociability is more determined by the environment that an animal is in rather than its inherent own social tendencies, then that's how it's going to change when it encounters these different environments, I think, across a reintroduction. Um, so I hope that just provides one example for that. Would anyone else like to add anything on that or shall I go on to the next question? Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question in that case. So this is one for you, Alicia. Um, you'll like this one. How does personality affect the spread of culture within social animals such as apes? Excellent question. <laughs> um, I, I, I will get back to you. Guy and I currently are trying to figure that out. I've done a bunch of experiments in the field showing um, how information spreads through the troops of baboons, um, but we're currently doing some modeling to determine how the distribution of um, personalities within social networks affects information flow through them. And the short answer is that if um, personality types are clustered together, it tends to have a rapid um, diffusion at the beginning while all of the individuals, for example, all the bold individuals learn from each other, um, but then it gets stuck because the other individuals in the group um, can't learn uh, or are, are not using that social information. So I, my gut feeling is that um, personalities will have a big will play a big role in the spread of information and thus the formation of cultures in groups. It was a good question. Thank you, Guy. <laughs> well, I, I can't uh, take the credit for it, but I'm very happy to have been the messenger. <laughs> so, um, and this is actually another question for you, Alicia, but it's in relation to the study that you reported on the apes, mm -hmm. on the great apes. Uh, and the question is, how was well-being monitored and assessed in those studies? Oh, in the great apes, they just asked the observers how <laughs> how much they would like to be that ape. So they, they ask them to imagine that they're that ape and say, would you be happy or not happy being that ape? So it was really, a, um, yeah, they were really getting an idea of, uh, of what, what that individual's social and, well, social and uh, life was like at that time and how much they wanted to be that individual. So, but I'm sure as in all other zoos, they were monitoring um, well-being in other ways. It's just that the, the measurement they used was this, um, put yourself in this primate's shoes and tell me how you would feel. So presumably that would also be affected by the personality of the observer. That's a good question that, um, <laughs> that we've been trying to get at, but it's very really, um, hard to do that. Uh, but yeah, but it's also a different, yeah, a different question altogether. That is a different question. Okay, um, well, let me move on in that case. Um, so, so I've got a question here again. I, I'm not sure uh, who this is aimed at specifically, but I think perhaps you, Vix. Uh, so the question is, is it possible? Yeah, it must be you really. Is it possible that trauma of being moved impacts sociability stroke personality? Um, yeah, I spotted that one come up, come up and I thought it might be for me too. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, definitely, like I said, these are uh, reintroductions are, are a quite unusual event for these animals to be going through. I mean, they're, in a, they're sort of often the only way that we can bring them back. So they are an essential conservation tool, but they're a slightly weird thing for the animals to experience. 
Um, so I guess one way that we could get at that is actually measuring it over a longer, like re-measuring it over a longer period, which I obviously, I'd only did it sort of immediately following the, the release, but we could look at perhaps when they're a bit more established later on, if they do maybe revert back to what we saw previously. And that would actually be a, a really cool thing to do. So uh, good, good uh, idea there. <laughs> So um, I'd actually just like to follow up with a question of my own as well uh, in that area, which is given the sociability wasn't a consistent predictor through the reintroduction, do you know what, what did determine the network formation uh, in the reintroduced population if it wasn't sociability? Um, yeah, again, I think we think, so we didn't test this explicitly, but um, from sort of what we've seen across a variety of different hee hee populations they do seem to sort of congregate near these water sites um right. the person who was actually collecting the data for me in the reintroduced population said that she was sort of spending time down in the swamp with the swamp group so it sounds like they're sort of aggregating in these kind of damp areas um so it may be that kind of resource aspect but we haven't sort of been collecting data for long enough yet to to know that for sure so can we ask you to come back in a year or two's time as well Great. Yep. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely feel a sequel coming on. OK, um, so Felicity, uh, do you know if more exploratory sharks were also more active? Yes, we did measure both traits. So and, and just as a reminder, an exploratory shark is when they're in a novel environment and activity is just what they do when they're in a non-novel, non-stressful environment. And what we found out is that more explorative sharks are not necessarily the most active ones. Mm. In fact, activity was pretty much scaling with size. So bigger sharks were just more active than the smaller ones. But uh, exploration had nothing to do with size and had nothing to do with their activity, which is super interesting. OK, great. Thank you. Um, all right. I have a question for Lewis. Uh, how do you know that what you're measuring is spider personality and not just differ differing responses to environmental conditions like warm or cold? Yeah, very good question, because it's such a different study species than normal. Um, so we haven't actually done the rigorous personality testing yet. But in the initial study, when we were looking at general behaviour, we recorded the environmental conditions and used that in our analysis. And that we found that didn't have any effect on the behaviours we were seeing. So the changes in behaviour were related to the interventions for management, so the moving between enclosures. Um, so yeah, we'll do the same thing for personality work. And uh, and I think it's probably the, we'll obviously aim to, it'll be repeated measures of these behaviour tests. So we'll uh, affect, uh, we'll control for that effect that way as well. But yeah, definitely something relevant with the, um, with the ectothermic species. I'm very excited just to see this work being done on invertebrates. It's very cool. Um, okay, Alicia, uh, a question for you. Um, in the baboon study, being bold seems to be the better personality, but in what context would being shy be better? Oh, that's a really good question. So first off, I don't know. So the foods that I gave to the baboons were not noxious, um, but if it was a noxious novel food, then it would not be a good thing for the individuals to be consuming it, in which case it would make it much better to be shy. Um, but I... I, I don't know is the short answer for baboons. I'm still working things out. But in another study system, a lizard um, study system, I did show that um, being shy being shy meant that they were less likely to be predated or have um, predation at attempts. Um, so being shy is good when it comes to predators. <laughs> um, and being bold, uh, as Felicity pointed out in her uh, in her study um, might be good for gaining access to food or to mates. So there seems to be a trade-off which try which might explain why variation in these traits is maintained through time. So um, this is another question that really relates well to that, but this could also be opened up to everyone. Um, is shyness influenced by age? Uh, in the baboons, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, so there, there are two actual, there are two big theories for, for why um, personality changes with age. So one comes from differential psychology and the other comes from behavioral ecology. And the differential psychologists are basically just describing what happens in humans, which is that we become less 
um, risk taking and uh, more averse to novel experiences as we get older. Uh, and that kind of makes sense. Like we, we gather data when we're young, when, or we gather information when we're young, we can apply it to the rest of our lives. Um, but then there's another theory from behavioral ecology that suggests that, um, that individuals should become more bold the older they are because they've got less to lose. Uh, so that's the, yeah, the idea that you've got um, nothing to lose from uh, taking a big risk later in life. So in the baboon system, it seems to support what we, what the human um, literature suggests that um, individuals tend to get quite shy at, with the age. So um, individuals are much bolder when they're young and they are consistent in their boldness when they're older, but their variation is, uh, is much reduced. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's great. But then <laughs> I'd like to yeah, offer that up to everyone else as well. And yeah, do any of our other speakers have any experience of how age might influence personality in their study systems? Um, so yes, in the macaques, we saw a similar, very similar pattern to what Lisa just described. Um, with the Siamangs, again, still doing a little bit of data analysis, but it seems to be there is a difference, um, but it's not quite as pronounced as in the other species. Um, but we did also find quite a key difference of sex in, in the macaques as well. So that was quite interesting and, and another factor that seems to affect personality across, across organisms sometimes. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I wonder if I've got just time to squeeze in one more question. So this is um, for Vix and Alicia. And the question is, uh, is a habituated population truly wild? How are you ensuring that you do not impact on normal behavior? I, I might just start that if that's all right. Um, so actually the, the hee hee population, we haven't gone through any formal habituation with those. Um, so they are, the only time we handle them is like at that initial stage when we're putting the bands on them and they are still wild after that. The difference is because they're a New Zealand species, they don't have that innate fear of predators. So they'll just sort of be getting on with their life around you. So I hope that kind of reassures you that yeah, they're not, we're not, we don't seem to be changing things when we're near them. We are also now monitoring them using sort of more remote technology. So we might have a way to sort of compare it as well um, from now on, but yeah. I think my answer would kind of build on um, Vix's one about the um, he he being naive to humans and therefore um, totally fine around them. So by truly wild, I think what people assume is that um, individual animals have a fear of humans and that that's not the case. For example, all of the species on the Galapagos were not afraid of humans when they arrived because they had no experience of them being predators, for example. So the idea of um, truly wild, I think, is a bit of an, a misnomer. Um, what we hope for um, habituation is that the baboons start to view us as just another part of the environment for example like a an antelope that's walking through obviously they don't treat us like antelopes because antelopes aren't fascinated in them and follow them around all of the time but they do start doing what we assume is normal behavior um, for them as if we we weren't there they're behaving in the way that they would when they're truly wild okay great that's a great answer thank you alicia and vix and Oh, sorry, you do sometimes I, I do have a, a comment on that and I think it's interesting because what Alicia said about um, these uh, animals not being afraid of humans it's also the case for lemon trunks and we do have this kind of problem that we don't know once we release them from one month with us if they're going to behave exactly the way they should behave they spend a month with us and they're fed and they're super cozy they're on holidays there is no predators so when we release them we actually don't start looking at them in the wild for two months we make sure that they get back to real life before we look at their behavior in the wild otherwise they're uh, probably not behaving the way we assume they should thank you felicity and thank you, Vix and Alicia and Lewis. Um, and thank you as well, our audience, for all your amazing questions. Uh, that's been a really fascinating set of conversations tonight. Um, so I think uh, it's just leaves it to me now to start wrapping everything up for this evening. Um, let me just look at my notes here. So um, if you're out there, uh, please don't go quite yet. 
Um, first of all, I would like to show you one last slide. So um, first of all, uh, if you've been watching tonight's event, um, we would be really keen to hear uh, what your thoughts are on it. Um, and it really helps us to think about our plan for future events if we get your feedback. So if you could uh, please um, fill out our, our Survey Monkey survey. Um, the address is, uh, is, is right here. Um, and you can also use the QR code um, to, to scan in. Um, that would be super helpful. Um, if you can't see that, it's uh, www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event 14. Uh, I'll just repeat that for you. It's www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event 14. Um, now, our next event, let's see if this will work. Um, okay, hold on a moment. Our next event will be on the 8th of March. I think I've got it. Um, and that will be entitled the IUCN Green Status of Species, How to Thrive, Not Just Survive. And you can find details on this, on this uh, next event and of all of our upcoming events on our website at www.zsl.com org uh, forward slash science forward slash events. Um, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Also on our website, there are plenty of other resources like our ZSL Wild Science podcast and information about how to get involved with ZSL by donating, volunteering or becoming a ZSL fellow. Uh, so I think that's everything from me. Uh, I just wanted to say a huge thank you again to all our speakers tonight for a really brilliant event. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next time. So um, thank you again and good night. <laughs>